went through the 60s in college apolitical. I had come from this nice Republican home where I was learning to be a good patriot and never met anybody who had experienced any oppression. When I went to college, everything opened up. It was the 60s and I was avoiding anything political. I would just like, oh, if you're going to talk politics, I'll leave. And yet, there was one thing that fascinated me, and that was the farm workers, because I had heard about Cesar Chavez refusing to have a nice paid job, refusing to be paid well as the head of this union he was founding, because he wanted to be poor like the workers. And that was the only reason I wanted to go when somebody said, I'm having somebody come over to my house, talk about the UFW, anybody want to come? I went. Not knowing that would totally change my life. That was the turning point in my life, one of them. Because I came out politicized, and the next thing you know, I'm on farm worker picket lines and doing a delegation to the local market, asking them not to sell the grapes and the, you know, the gala wine and the lettuce. Mom suggested I get a credential to quote fall back on in case I didn't become a screenwriter right out of college. And the problem is this is the worst reason in the world to go into teaching. But fortunately I ended up loving it. You know, I probably would have made it as a screenwriter and as a children's book writer if I had had a really boring job. If I could have come home from, oh, hate my work. You know, it just it's boring, it's drudgery, I can't take it. I just go and I just develop my writing career. But instead, I was coming home from this really exciting job, but very draining job of teaching, especially since I got into inner city. Teaching is the most time consuming career there is, and nobody told me that. My brother Randy was really great at tap. Ray more like ballet. I like the ballet and the tap and the acrobatics a little. But mom and dad were amateur photographers. We had a dark room that they would turn our service porch into. And so we all got dressed up in our favorite costumes. Me and my gypsy, Randy and his Buster Brown, and Ray and his toy soldier. I remember so many pictures of me the only person, they were all standing on their left foot, kicking their right foot, and there I am, facing the other direction, and standing on both foot. I mean, I guess I wasn't quite as out of it as this little girl. Oh, it just looks really shy. I was actually born in Sunland. It's a um, little suburb of L.A. in the northern part. That was my world for a while, growing up in the 50s. Pretty much a lily white community, although I went to Catholic schools, which are like magnets if there are any Latinos in the community, you're likely to have a bigger concentration of them than in the city. And then I just discovered the real world <laughs> a little later. After Going to a Catholic high school in Glendale, I went away to Whittier. Mom wanted me to be far enough away so I couldn't bring home my laundry and close enough so we could still do things together. I had great parents. Somewhere in junior high school, we were doing career day. It's just like, what I want to be when I grow up? I don't know. What do you mean, what I want to be? I just, you know? But in junior high, this other girl said, I'm going to be a writer, and I thought, you could be a writer. I could... Oh, all those books, they're written by people. All those movies, they're made by people writing the story down and the actor's story. Oh, that's what I'm going to do. And so, I just, I knew I'd be a writer. You know, I was brought into the world by a female doctor. And so, even though in the 50s, it was just not promoted, but my mom, she was just on an, a, a step ahead of that. And she told me, and she told my two brothers, we could be anything we wanted to be. And I didn't really know there would be limitations. When I was a kid, my family would go out to a drive-in movie and in my family station wagon. And it got to the point where 
I just didn't like the ending. I didn't like where it was going. I thought, geez, I could do better than this. And I'd pretend to be sleepy, and then I'd get in the back end and curl up in that wonderful little cozy little place in the back of the station wagon and rewrite the ending and follow the characters I had been watching. When I was in second grade, I was in church and with my family and looked down at the church bulletin and there was my name and there was this little paragraph there and I just said, I wrote that in my classroom. but. You know, all 72 of the second graders of that school had written the same paragraph. It was the same assignment. And they picked mine. And it was like, you know, it's a child's version of a Pulitzer. Until mom said, how are you going to wear your hair when you're wearing the mortarboard and in the cap and gown for graduation? And I knew I couldn't put a mortarboard hat um, over that. So I said, oh, I don't know. And she said, why don't you wear that new surfer girl style? And I said, straight, uh, yeah, uh, uh. and she said, just for that one day. And so I did, and I've never worn it any other way since. It was three months in between um, one teaching job and subbing in a school district, and I just assumed it would be Los Angeles somewhere. Uh, so I was going to be full-time working for five dollars a week plus room and board and then it was just so exciting I put in an extra year after that. So I had been assigned to, I won't say the name of this town, because they were so conservative. They were so so like I was when I was raised. I would say, hi, I'm a volunteer with the United Farm Workers, and they'd say, the United Pharmacists? I swear I heard that so many times there. And everybody was crossing a picket line. If I found somebody who would even stop and talk, I was just like, okay, these are people like I was when I grew up. We had this campaign where they were going to briefly put all the people who spoke Spanish in East LA and all the people who didn't in Compton or Watts so that we could do a voting reg drive. And we did this fantastic voting reg drive because there was a farm market proposition on the ballot. And it was, you know, people told me, Carol Francis, they're going to send you to Compton. You're going to get people who despise you and hate you because you're white or they hate you because you're working with the farm workers and they see those as those Mexicans and they're not going to like you. Both of those things happen once each, very briefly. In every other experience I had, it was like, whoa, these people are fantastic. They'd come over to me. They'd say, what can I do to help? They would say, oh, no, shop your shirt, fine. You know, I, we were asked, see if you could get volunteers for the summer. And I said, yeah, I'm going to get people at Compton College to say, okay, I'll spend the summer doing $5 a week plus room and board, no problem. And I, mean, I mean, it was just amazing. People were so embracing. And I said, huh, that's where I'm going to teach next year. And I thought, well, I'm sure they have schools here. I mean, their families here. That's how I became conscious and politicized and I loved working in Compton. I subbed there for two and a half years but I couldn't make it through a summer vacation without borrowing. So when I got a chance to work in LA I signed up for Watts which was pretty close. Teaching like I said is just the most time-consuming job because when you come home from kindergarten you look at all these 20 papers and you go she made the A correctly on all those put a sticker on it. I love teaching I hated what they did with education uh, eventually. It just got to be like too rigid and too much teaching those things that are going to be tested and making sure the kids learn those skills because those were going to be on the test. I would do things to make make the lesson come alive and I would just be afraid that the principal would walk in on me while I'm doing something that's not in the script. They made these books just before Christmas that I'd have them think about. Um, 
If you could give a present to anybody in the world, what would it be? And if there was a homeless, don't just think about money, food, and clothes. Think about what if you could give them homes and what would the homes be like? And what would they have in their community? And if there were people that were lonely, maybe they weren't poor but they were lonely what kind of friends would you like to give them and they were coming up with I'd give wonderful little foster kids to the lonely old people and these would come from foster kids or you know it was just like so great but that's the sort of thing I'd get in trouble for because I'm not I can't do that anymore I have to just stick with the script and so the the year that it came clear that none of that was being allowed anymore was uh, a friend of mine my 80 year old friend said she just loved reading their stories and uh, it just she realized what wonderful kids I had so I told my class that and these were kids that I said tell me about your class what do people think of your class well we're the worst class in school um, people are really hate it when we come you know it's just like that was their self-image, so I told them what my neighbor said. I made copies of the books that they had made, and reading and saying, their assignment was to write an essay saying, people say bad things about our class, but it's not true because this is the sort of things we write. And they loved it and they were quiet and the principal walked in and I thought this is great she walks in when they're all this class it is so hard to keep them quiet and on task they're just just so into the work I got in trouble for it and that's when I was told you know you are not to do anything that's not in the teacher's manual and it's just like and then it just went worse from there I retired, took early retirement, and I've never regretted that. I miss the kids. That's why I volunteer with the Pan African Film Festival, with the Student Fest, so at least once a year I get to help bring the kids from the buses into the theater where they get their free film and, and talk with them. And Yeah, I love that. So I miss the kids, I miss the teaching, but I just don't miss the other stuff that was going on. You know, and then when I retired, I have much more time and just less money for things like entering them into a screenplay contest, which is expensive. On an interview with John Sales, whom I just really, really love, he was being interviewed by David Barsamian of Alternative Radio. And David asked him, so do you have any advice to give to new filmmakers? And without a pause to think it over, John Sale said, yeah, I'll get a life. Basically what he said was, you know, kids come out of college, they go to film school, they graduate, they've never had a real job, they've never worked as a working person in you know and then they go make a movie about life without having ever lived it and he said do you want to make good films do something with your life and then go make the film later so I thought I love that I spent two and a half decades teaching and having the most amazing experiences in Compton and Watts with these absolutely wonderful young people um, I've traveled the world, you know, wherever there's people do, trying to change their way of, that they're treated from Cuba to Palestine to, you know, Central America. I, you know, this is my life. I, I just haven't gone to film school. So I said, oh, right, John Sales model. Uh, that's, okay. Somebody said, yeah, listen, if you've written a really good script, you can throw it out of the window of your car and somebody will pick up and that movie will get made because it's, and I'm going, well, not if it's about, you know, labor union struggle. Um, not if it's about anything I would write about. Maybe if it was Rombo 6 or, you know, the Terminator, you know, whatever number we're on. 
but my kind of movie, no. We should have an organization made up both film, progressive filmmakers, the writer, the directors, the Danny Glovers and Susan Sarandons and the, you know, all these really great people that are out there and they're doing, they, they walk picket lines. But also the activists, including activists who have never even thought of making movies, but they love going to them and they know the stories that should be on the big screen. Obviously, Avatar didn't need our help. It was the best watched movie of all time. You know, that kind of a movie where you don't need to do a documentary showing that you, what war is all about. One of the things that either the agent or the manager said is, you get me a screenplay that has, and this is what he described as we should be submitting to him. He said, an action film with a male protagonist and the female in a romantic subservient role. And so I said, okay. Um, so during the Q&A, I raised my hand. I said, I've written an action film with a female protagonist and a male in a romantic subservient role. And I don't want you to get it to the studios. I want you to get it to an independent um, production company run by a producer with a social conscience. I would like to find an agent and a manager with a social conscience. How would I do that? And he said, quote, we don't have social conscience, end of quote. You know, there's that whole thing about is the glass half empty and half, or it's a half full. Well, you know, obviously it's both. But you can choose. You can choose to be happy. And one of the things I did when I was teaching in Watts, sometimes I'd have kids that were really had really bad things in their lives and were quite negative. And I'd, I'd, I just once I put up a sign over my bullet, my uh, chalkboard saying, choose to be happy. Because you know things are really problematic and messed up in some ways, but there's some wonderful things and you can choose to say, okay, I know there's war and you know what government is doing to people all over the world very often is terrible. I know that. I'd hear about napalm on children and I'd hear about uh, fire hoses and police batons on African American civil rights activists. And I wouldn't want to know about it. I mean, it's just like, I don't want to know about things I can't do anything about. But on the other hand, once I found out, and that's what I learned through this United Farmers thing, is I can be part of a solution. So yeah, there are these terrible things about going on. But you know, we're activists, we're working on it, we're going to straighten it up. I pitched this story, and afterwards she said, well, I love your story, but after 9-11, studios won't do anything on police uh, brutality because it's considered unpatriotic. And those were her exact words, and I just thought, oh, great, now the police get to beat people up and we can't say anything. Um, Paul Haggis once said, if you are writing about something that has a whole lot of social reality and you're skipping that and you're, you're avoiding it, that's a political movie. It's a political decision to not deal with the issues. And he said, those are just easier to sell. And I, I looked at them, that's one of the reasons I found a breakthrough, is that idea that if you're really writing about police brutality or the war or, you know, people struggling against the system to get out of poverty, not just, uh, you know, struggling against those things that may have made this one person fall into poverty, but against the systemic things that cause, if you're writing about that, it's really too scary. So um, what we wanted to do with Breakthrough is support that kind of filmmaking and have people whose stories should be on the big screen, 
Well, my favorite movie of all time is Salt of the Earth. And it came out in 1954. And I saw it in the 70s when I was volunteering full time with the United Farm Workers. Like I said, I was really apolitical in college in the 60s, but I'm going, okay, I want to be a writer. And I just see how making a movie like this just change people's attitudes towards themselves and towards others and towards women and towards people of color and typewriter is mightier than the sword and the or the computer is mightier than the sword whatever you use writing is just such an empowering thing it, the suburbs are just too I mean just uh too nice to me what I love most about Los Angeles, and I'm living in the in Koreatown now, kind of the heart of LA, is that LA has so many peoples. So I saw this um, thing uh, from New Filmmakers LA, and it was a contest, a call for a contest to produce a four minute or less film on what's your LA. So I, what I love about LA is the ethnic diversity. So I wrote this very short story about little kids discovering the ethnic wonders of Los Angeles. So um, it got into the film festival. It was one of the 24 that were selected and as finalists and my cast which were a s almost seven year old a and a 13 year old and a couple kids in between all got to see themselves on the kind of a big screen sort of medium sized screen and have people come up to them and say oh you were in that film you were very good it was just really exciting it was like one of the last things you see is this mural and above it it says the Byzantine Latino quarters and the mural is of two angels each with one wing with their arms around each other and it says we're all angels with one wing we only fly by embracing each other so that's what our movie ended up with that's my LA I asked a friend of mine who's a SAG actress and she read one of my shorter screenplays. It's called Mother Earth Speaks and you never see the other woman but I wanted an African American voice. So I got this woman who was just really great and that's just basically the whole film. Thank you Women in Film for producing two really good actresses. My mom used to call me the most extroverted introvert she had ever met but I do love people especially if they're really doing wonderful things. The activist community, other teachers, other people who are involved in relating to life and being alive. I just, they're constant inspiration. At the end of the day, no matter what, I've lived and I've affected other people and other people have affected me. People have loved me and I've loved others. I've taught little kids and I know sometimes they come back into my life and say, hey, Miss Likens, you remember me. I was in your third grade class. And it's like, people remember me and they actually sometimes come up and say, you taught me this. And I know someday what I write is going to be on the big screen and it's going to be in children's books where little kids and their mommies can pick it up. Even the little things like if I write a political essay and e-blast it out and somebody said, hey, you know, I really liked what you wrote and I, it really nailed it and it was really what we needed to hear. I just feel so, I, I feel so good. Like I've lived and I've touched people. You know, that's all in the peace and justice movement. That's all we're struggling for. That's it. It's a world in which every single person can know 
that they can touch other people's lives in some way and that they are real and they mean something. We all mean something, that's all.